and welcome to this episode of Every Current. I'm your host, Bill Florence, and today I'm excited about our topic because it's really at the top of the news. It's resource adequacy. How do we ensure that we have electricity needs to be where it needs to be? Uh, and that really is coming into focus here with what's going on in the American Southwest at this point in time. I'm joined today by two experts from EPRI's resource adequacy team. I have Irene Dante Lopez and Genevieve de Majorla. Ladies, welcome very, very much. Before we get started, tell our audience a little bit more about yourselves, please. Sure. Um, so my name is Irene Dante. I'm an engineer at EPRI, and my research work here focuses mainly on the area of resource adequacy, as well as the area of demand flexibility. And I'm joining in today from France. I'm Jenna. Uh, I've been at EPRI for a little over two years now. I'm a technical leader here at EPRI, also working on resource adequacy. Um, joined right as this big multi-year resource adequacy for a decarbonized future was being kicked off. Um, and working from my home office in Massachusetts. Let's begin by maybe talking about, maybe defining what is resource adequacy? Sure, Bill. So resource adequacy looks into whether a power system has appropriate set of supply resources to maintain continuous service to demand with the desired level of certainty. So essentially, we're looking at whether a power system, generation, storage, and interconnection resources will be able to meet customers' demand. Um, some questions we ask in resource adequacy are, what are the time periods during which the system might be at risk of not being able to meet customer demand? Uh, what is the magnitude of possible shortfall events? And what are the underlying causes for those events where we're not able to meet customer demand? Has that definition I mean, changed over the course of time? I mean, I know that we're, we've gone from maybe sort of like, you know, traditional maybe ways of you know, producing electricity. I mean, now we're, and now we've added, you know, renewables and then there are the different issues with all that. I mean, so has the definition changed, um, uh, Jenna? Um, I mean, I'd say the core definition is fairly similar. There's been a few tweaks. I think the idea that demand can now play more of a role, um, you know, before load was just something that would request uh, electricity and now you have uh a load that can be flexible and respond to disturbances. Um, so I'd say that's been a little bit of a change in the definition. Um, but most of the changes have been really in terms of how we've been um, modeling and assessing resource adequacy. So that, that key concept remains the same, but we're really considering it differently these days. And is that what based on like new factors or why, 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 why is that change occurring at this point in time? Yeah, I mean, there, there's quite a few things. I think partly um, just computationally, we've got a lot more computational power than we did before. So there's um, definitely more of a capability to analyze things in a little more depth. Um, there's also the fact that our resource mix has really changed. So back in the day, if you had just thermal generators, they were all dispatchable. Um, you didn't really have to consider things like um, energy adequacy, which is something that you see with energy storage, you know, they can provide uh, power to the grid, but only if they're charged up. So there's that aspect that's been brought in. Um, there's a dispatchability issue with wind and solar generation as well. Um, you know, you do have wind and solar generation, but you can't always count on it just being there um, at, the, at, at the flip of a switch. Um, it, it's there when the wind's Flowing and not otherwise. Um, so there's additional complexity there that you definitely have to capture in the model and, and quite a bit of complexity that's still really being studied in terms of how to incorporate that into resource adequacy models. Um, things like flexibility adequacy are now being talked about. This idea that, you know, if your solar power or your wind power goes down all at once, you need your thermal generators to be able to ramp up really quickly to be able to provide the demand that to be able to provide load or meet load. Um, those are all things that are being uh, really considered now in resource adequacy. And climate change m must obviously have a uh, play a role in this and as far as the, the planning and stuff like this and looking at how weather is changing and demand, mm -hmm. how that affects demand and stuff like that. I mean, is, is, that, uh, is that accurate, uh, Irene? Absolutely. Climate change plays a big role in how we're thinking about resource adequacy now. 
there are many questions that feed into it. There's the question of extreme events, uh, extreme cold events, and extreme heat events. There's also the question of droughts. Uh, water is essential to power generation in many parts of the world. Um, the kind of obvious uh, thought related to water is hydroelectric generation. So hydro dams and uh, runoff river uh, generation. Uh, if there's droughts, we can get less power out of um, that type of generator. But there's also power plants that rely on water for cooling and that cannot work without that cooling water availability, like nuclear plants, for example. So a lack of water uh, can actually also lead to a lack of generation from certain um from certain power plants that are not hydropower plants. So there's, there are very significant impacts uh, of climate change on generation availability. And on demand, of course, there's the, the side of if there's an extreme heat event or an extreme cold event, the customer is going to need more electricity to, to heat or to cool their homes. How is the planning process changing in order to accommodate a lot of these different, um, these different factors and new factors? I mean, factors that are that are different from the traditional way that uh, maybe sort of resource adequacy has been addressed in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's a quite a few different ways this is planning. So I think I'll touch on a couple of them now. Um, Irene was talking about the rise in extreme events, and we've seen um, you know winter storm Uri and Elliot and some of the the California load shed events a couple summers ago, um, really illustrating that. Um, one thing that's changing is our metrics. Historically, we'd use what we called an LOLE metric, which is a loss of load expectation. Um, and it basically looks at the expected number of loss of load days um, over, a certain, over a certain time frame. And so most of the time, a lot of the regions in the US, their target is one day in 10 years. So you have to have less than one load shed event um, day in a 10 year period. And now, that metric, it doesn't really give you an idea of how long that load shed event occurs. Is it a full day event? Is it just a half hour? And it more importantly, doesn't give you uh, an indication of the magnitude of the event at all. So it could be you know, the difference between a, a 10 megawatt and a 10,000 megawatt event in terms of customer impact is obviously huge. So one of the things we're looking at is revisiting our metrics to really get an idea for that. And more and more people are considering um, what we call an EUE metric, an expected unserved energy metric, and that gives you an idea of the magnitude of your loss of load event. Um, so that's one really key change. Um, and then more and more people are trying to figure out ways to really capture that impact of extreme events specifically. So we call them TIL events or high impact, low frequency events. Um, there's a few different ways you can go about that. Um, Belgium has actually implemented an LOLE 95 metric. So that's looking at the 95th percentile of your LOLE metric, as opposed to the average expected value. Um, some people are starting to run deterministic scenarios that really focus in on those extreme weather scenarios and their impact to the grid. So a few different things looking at it there. Um, there's also a lot of changes to uh, the methodology. Um, any right now, I don't know if you, you want to jump in here. Sure, there's significant changes on the methodology side of things. Uh, what I think is something very interesting uh, is developing models to account for new assets that we have never had to look at in resource adequacy. Things like demand flexibility, maybe from electric vehicle charging, things like electrolyzers, um, Many new assets we don't have established models for today, but that can make a very significant impact on resource adequacy and power system reliability. You know, we've used this term a couple of times, and, I'm, uh, and I just want to make sure that maybe we're all on the same page on this, but loss of load. I mean, what, is, what exactly does that mean? Loss of load or a shortfall event um, is a time where your energy company is unable to meet customer load. So, you know, you flip your light switch and, and there's no power. And, and now there, from a customer perspective, there's a lot of times you might have that happen that wouldn't be a resource adequacy event. So there might be, um, you know, a distribution lounge down in your, in your neighborhood, for example. That wouldn't be considered a resource adequacy event. It would really be if you didn't have enough generation on your system to be able to supply load to the customer. I think there's some mention or discussion or at least one factor here talking about like, I think in the past, I mean, there was an assumption that 
you know, these types of out, all outages were like maybe un correlated that maybe it was that they just i don't know if they just happened or exactly what that means i mean what does that mean exactly and then how has that changed that's one of the key modeling changes we're really starting to see um and it's a big departure from how we've been doing things so historically we've always assumed that outages are statistically independent and uncorrelated so one plant can go on outage because of you know, some issue with their generator or whatever um, and the plants around it are statistically probably still going to be online. Um, and now we're seeing with extreme weather events, that's, that's no longer true. And those are the events that are really hitting our systems. What happens is there's a couple different things. We're having more and more gas generation on the system um, and uh, a lot of uh, shortages or um, limitations in terms of gas supply during extreme events are going to hit a lot of the plants on the same pipeline or all the plants in the same pipeline at once. And then you've got another component to it as well, which is um, during extreme heat or extreme cold, a lot of plants are just statistically more likely to outage. That's a, a harder operating point for them. So at that point in time, you might have more outages, a higher outage rate during those cold events. And then there's things like, um, you know, wind blade freezings and coal piles, freezings, and all those things like that. But essentially, we're seeing that we can no longer have that assumption of outages being uncorrelated. We really have to account for that correlated outage within our modeling. Um, and so that's something we're really actively investigating here at EPRI, and a lot of folks are really actively trying to figure out how they can, how they can fit that into their planning models. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, I mean, what, what is happening at EPRI? I mean, what, 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 some of the, what are the, some of the, the current focus areas within resource adequacy uh, here, here at EPRI? We've had this multi-year initiative called Resource Adequacy for a Decarbonized Future, uh, where we've been trying to give a very big push to all topics in resource adequacy. So we have been looking into a lot of the topics that Jenna and myself have previously mentioned here, Things like uh, metrics, uh, data, models, existing tools, how to generate appropriate scenarios to capture these extreme weather events that we have talked about. Um, that, is, that has been a very big initiative that we're actually, uh, it's, it's wrapping up this year. Uh, everything from all of the work we've done there will be public. Uh, publicly available to to everyone because this is a very important conversation and we want to be in a place where we can actively engage with other power system planners out there and other folks that are interested and involved in this area. Um, we also have a long-standing research program here at EPRI that looks at resource adequacy um, and that will be ongoing um, even after this big initiative uh, closes off this year. I will say this is something we're considering at EPRI, but it's really something that's a very active research topic across the industry. So ESIG and NREL and DOE and uh, a fair number of ISOs and energy companies, regulators, this is something that's being actively considered from a lot of different angles. Um, we're trying to collaborate as much as we can with all these different research groups to come up with something cohesive that's really going to move the industry forward. I'm just wondering, is it from, and again, from, you know, I'm not an expert, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm just looking at trying to, you know, create these different models. I mean, it seems incredibly complex, you know, to be, to, to do all of this. I mean, I mean, so how does, is this done? I mean, we had mentioned earlier, the fact that we have now this additional sort of computational ability, you know, I mean, and that, that's all seems to be improving, you know, sort of exponentially, I guess, you know, maybe, um, maybe even use some, some type of artificial intelligence in doing some different things like this. But I mean, um, this is complex, isn't it? So, Bill, I think it's worth mentioning here that uh, models can refer to both the tool you use to run a resource adequacy study and a model that you use to represent a how a particular asset behaves in real life. Uh, and both are very complex areas of research. So, on the model side of things, developing models for things like demand flexibility, it takes a long time because those models need to be, be based on real life data. We need to have a very solid understanding of how different assets behave in real life. And that only comes from trials that energy companies or other 
actors in the field might might put together and collect data of how how these new assets behave. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in that area to understand how to appropriately model uh, demand flexibility, electrolyzers, uh, electric vehicle charging, all and all of these new uh, assets that are coming onto the system. And there's also a lot of research on the tool side of things. And then maybe maybe I'll send this one over to Jenna. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I, I'd like to add to is, so there's a huge amount of complexity, but it doesn't mean that every single system has to model everything. Um, and I think that's one of the things we're trying to do at EPRI is provide guidance in terms of where you really need a lot of detail and where you can maybe get away with a little bit less. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a system that's really, really hydro heavy, you're going to have to provide um, more, more complexity, um, more detail for your hydro modeling than if you're a system that really doesn't have much hydro modeling. So there's, there's intricacies there as well. Um, there's providing information for folks in terms of where they can find the data that they need um, you know, for example, to model all these extreme weather events, you need a really long correlated weather uh, weather data set to be able to accurately represent that. Um, so, so it's providing some of that guidance to really allow uh, planners to navigate that. And definitely hugely complex uh, tools are moving forward as well. More and more tools have got parallelization. They've got, um, we are seeing some tools that are sort of uh, having an initial screening to identify probable risky periods and then only analyzing those in depth. So um, there's quite a bit the industry is doing, um, but most of all, it's providing guidance on really where you should focus your attention for maximum impact. Let me ask you both. I mean, so as resource adequacy experts, I mean, what keeps you up at night? I mean, what uh, what bothers you about what's maybe coming up down the road? That's a great question. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, it's an understanding that there's certain things we haven't yet managed to accurately capture in models. So, for example, climate change, I think, is is a good example where we've got models now. There's climate models that can predict, um, for example, the temperature increase, and, and they're pretty good at that. Um, they're less good at predicting things like extreme storm events. So that's something we're modeling the Northeast, for example, in one of our case studies. And that's really um, what a lot of folks there are worried about is those extreme storm events. Um, and I'm not a climate expert, but my understanding is um, some of those storm cells are, are much harder to predict in, in a long-term climate model. So things like that where, um, you know, we're, we're still figuring out exactly what the best way is to model those to really um, accurately reflect them in our resource adequacy models. Extreme events, I think, is a big one also because how do you assign a probability to an event like that? I mean, we're looking at probabilistic modeling. That's what we're doing in resource adequacy. Um, that, that's a really challenging thing to do. On top of Jenna's comments, I would, I would say that a big question is also we are moving towards climate scenarios that we have never experienced in the past. Uh, how do we generate scenarios for something that we have no historical data for uh, and that are still, to some extent, relatively unknown? Well, now I was going to ask you some sort of like, we know what keeps you awake. But now, what helps you sleep more soundly at night, knowing that, I mean, that maybe we're moving in the right direction? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of changes happening fairly quickly by by our industry standard in terms of um, you know different models incorporating new new modeling aspects that they hadn't even a few years prior. I think um, capacity accreditation, which is very much related to resource adequacy. I mean, most ISOs right now are considering some kind of new construct or evaluating that in some way or another. Um, so just the the sheer amount of folks working on that actively and considering it. And I think there's just a much broader dialogue. You know, even everyday folks now have heard of a winter storm. Yuri was in the news for weeks. Um, there's just much more of a, a broad understanding of the topic and, and of the importance of the topic than I think there was before. We're experiencing a great level of collaboration within the industry. And uh, we are seeing things move forward. 
even in a relatively short period of time. Your name, Jenna, thank you again so much for joining us today. I know I've learned a lot and this is a very important topic and I'm sure we'll be bringing you back on for another episode in the future. Our podcast is available as always on Apple and Spotify, and we have a video version that's available on YouTube. I encourage you to subscribe to the channel of your choice and let us know how we're doing. We appreciate that. You can also go to our website at www.epri.com to learn more about EPRI and to learn more about our podcast. So until next time, I'm Bill Florence, and thank you for joining us here on the EPRI Current. If you like today's show, we invite you to subscribe to our podcast and feel free to share the podcast with your colleagues and friends. For more information about EPRI, please visit our website at www.epri.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter at EPRI News. Together, we are shaping the future of energy.